Well, okay. Good day, people recording. So this is the first meeting for 2017, 2018. 2017 is gone. Uh, so thanks for showing up, and it's an update to as far as what we're doing. Let's change the light here a little bit, maybe. Is that any better? No, that's I'm in the dungeon. Um, okay. This is the micro house too that I'm in. So here's here's a brick wall. If you look at it brick walls okay welcome everybody so so let's uh, get the year started thanks for showing up and first we, we have an agenda so please everybody take a look at that uh, pasting that in this is being recorded so that anyone who misses that can view this afterwards so a little bit of review from last year altogether uh, first thing is that last year was a total of 6,333 hours. So that's what the graph actually sums up to. The graph that we keep track track of. Uh, total is 6,000 over. How much value that is that? That's a lot of value. Um, if you value it at minimal $10, $10 an hour, so it's like $63,000 worth of contributions. Of course, we want this to grow. We want to scale our efforts as always. So... Um, in a meeting, I'd like to just go over where we are right now and have anyone else who's doing work right now. I know we kind of took a long break for the winter holiday. Um, I'd like people to pipe in on where we are. And I'd like to start with uh, progress reports of what, what I've been doing lately. I'd also like to ask for a note taker. So do we have a note taker available? Uh, I'd like to call out for a note taker. Can uh, can someone do that? I can. Uh, Abe, Abe or Roberto? Was that Roberto? Yeah, um, okay. Okay, Roberto. Why don't you do that? Uh, even though. You guys fight over that, but yeah, uh, please go ahead. So page two, uh, let's let's do that. So first thing on the agenda, so I'm going to go through all the items A through M on the agenda, progress reports. So first of all, I've been thinking about the project itself. I've been thinking about Linux a lot as far as uh, how Linux works. And uh, one thing that I, I'm working on right now, so if you look at my log, I'm, I actually started writing a book that where I basically drop down all the knowledge that I know about the project in terms of how it's organized, what we're working on, how we go about developing it to align everybody. Because I think that's actually missing quite a bit. Um, so a cohesive view of what all is going on, kind of like a, somewhat like a call to arms for everybody who's a, a future developer. That to me would be the, the main goal of the book you have to start with aligning everyone's efforts so so we're really pulling together and and I can say that I've been at it for a decade you can say as far as the actual global village construction set itself that word I started using that uh, I think it was 2009 uh, 2009 or I forget it's around 2010 or so uh, about six years since then just really developing working on that fully but I think it's it's very important to to do that if you want to look at my log you can take a look at that and uh, it's it's at the state of rough writing right now uh, a lot of the different ideas but I I want to go over pretty much the global village construction set like how it's developed like what the projects that we're working on how we can approach it strategically to go forward in the best way so uh, one of the main things regarding Linux how Linux works is one major lesson if you study Linux and there's also a critique of the open source is the financial feedback loops right so while people talk about open source development as oh people are scratching their itch or whatever I mean that's not what Linux was I mean Linux is clearly an example where okay so say Linus developed the first you know s said hey I'm gonna write me an operating system in 1991 
people joined it. But the thing that was there is that it was a product and, and a real product that people can pretty soon get get livelihoods from, which in its history in a 20 year period resulted in a first billion dollar company, Red Hat, and of course the overall impact of Linux is much greater. I would say it's about a trillion dollars right now if you look at all the software projects revolving around Linux that exist. Uh, so definitely there's a financial feedback loop that has to happen. Otherwise, why are people doing that? Um, can't be just for fun. It, you have to end up at, okay, are you doing it for a living? I think the, the part that you can make a living from it, also one of the essential designs of Linux, the the freedom to sell the product uh, and make a livelihood, that's it's a, it's a big thing. It's a, it's a critical aspect. And when I think about that for open source ecology, I think it's one thing that we can do better on and get many more people involved when we're transitioning to the livelihood part as a real outcome and, and making that that real if you look at the mission of open source ecology it's to create the the open source economy uh, it's really mass creation of right livelihood i've talked about this before and i'll continue saying this but i think the opportunity right now that we have in our hand is is on the 3d printer on the on a brick press, those are the, and a house, actually those three, if we take a look at those three, I think those three are the biggest candidates that can result in a lot of economic activity happening that we can also collaborate on. So uh, what can we focus on for 2018? <clears throat> we're, we're definitely working on a 3D printer. We are, if we talk about that, there's, um, the filament maker also we we started the Lyman filament extruder last year and just now I've been uh, been continuing the discussion with with Matt Rogie from the Thunderhead filament maker so uh, if someone who someone if you click on D and E please take a screenshot of that and paste it into slides number three four and five if someone can do that take the links from D E and F in the index on page one so the PV system hydronic stove and, and thunderhead filament extruder if you can paste those into the document that would be great but the thunderhead okay so that's I like it uh, talking to Matthew or Matt from the project he's got a good product he's been working on it for many years like since I think 2012 um, so we can pursue both the thunderhead and the Lyman filament maker um, both very good Projects. The Thunderhead is very impressive and it's much more advanced than the Lyman, yet it builds on a lot of the same elements and, and there's a lot of... Uh, but the, the idea here is if someone is working on it in a very co coherent way and they are and they did decide to open source it to the point that I'd like to run a, a workshop on that um, later in a year, maybe mid-year, because their filament maker is fully open source and quite good. So definite opportunity. But thinking about the, the collaborative enterprise on the 3D printer, that's, you know, we've got the, right now I'm actually putting together a 12 inch bed 3D printer for myself and also actually to ship out to a person from a former workshop. But the 3D printer is, is a lot of promise. We've done the, the circuit mill with it. We can do something like a three watt laser cutting head, which you can cut cardboard for models. Uh, so, so the 3D printer can can be the core part of a little micro factory that we can actually start producing real things. So, with a circuit mill, with 3D printing, and with the ability to cut things, you can create a lot of different products from from like replicas of the 3D printer, like kits for 3D printers, aerial drones, robotic arms, uh, cameras, digital cameras, laptops. You know, think about making a 3D printed laptop case and other components off the shelf. But lots of different products that are, that are possible with that if, if we want to do that. But I'm thinking that uh, as far as the collaborative enterprise, there's a lot of elements that we can develop together in terms of um, like a marketing website where, uh, think about it, how do, how do people, um, how can people make revenue from this? I mean, there's a lot of different products around the 3D printer from selling kits to selling products to selling information products like all our stuff is free but also we can charge for things like if it's a printed book little swag pieces like stickers and other things um, 
giving some thought to the marketing aspect can produce uh, uh, something where we can we, we can all share that, develop that collaboratively. So that, for example, like um, you know, even take the the brick press. Like, say you know, you know, Roberto, say you're you're in the middle of of Chile somewhere there. Um, how does a person start producing brick presses? Well, I mean, you can do what you can do. Like, like if you you can, for example, create a website where you can actually be selling kits that you figured out how to get cut locally, and and you're a kit seller, say for for Chile, you know, like anywhere. Um, it requires work that the person who's running any kind of enterprise learns and provides that value of the information and skills and know-how. So you can't just clone a website and call it and you're going to get rich off it. No, I mean, it's something that you invest in and you learn a lot about it. So you're, you're literally selling your information in the digital economy. You're, but at this, as the economy switches from products to services to experiences, like an experience economy, which is a forthcoming thing. So anyway, I'd like to you know have you guys think about or have people think about whoever is listening to this about ways we can collaborate such that there's a direct feedback like if you if you work on, on a website like templates like imagine a 3d printer website where we're spawning not just one but a number of these businesses worldwide and I think we can encourage people to slowly and surely to create better products it starts of course with great open source product design like when we finish up and really really refine the 3d printer I think that's a great product we can be selling kits anyone could do that if you have a 3d printer so a lot of different, uh, let's think about how we can leverage collaboration to make that happen in all kinds of ways. Because, I mean, the 3D printing case for uh, a lot of different products can be made. So, so that's just a thought. Um, if you click on the 3-watt three, three laser thing, let's see, I'm going to share my screen here so you can, you can look at where I'm looking. Um, share screen. Yeah, uh, you know, three watt laser. Um, you can get this little laser for three watts, and because our three watts, um, six, like sixty dollars, and this thing works, we can add that to D three D. That would be a great thing. So this is an example of that on my screen here. Um, cutting up to six millimeter plywood, the little little plywood stuff. Um, but I just thought of that as okay, that technology exists, and and our heads for for D3D are interchangeable. We have quick connect magnets on the head, so that would be actually a great product. I'd like to see if we can develop that. It's, I think it's a great uh, great product that we can add to our D3D infrastructure, just like the, the circuit mill. Uh, so that's the product of a three uh, laser cut with this tiny three watt laser. So think about how that relates to us if if you for example like say say we design the brick press which is made of flat steel you can cut out a complete model of the brick press using flat modeling or like the house model for for open building institute which we promise as a reward for kickstarter you can make kits for that um, but basically if you can cut out of two-dimensional plywood you can actually prototype scale models of the real big machines, including tractors. I mean, we can cut out tubing. You can take cardboard and bend bend paper into tubing to make tubes, and you can literally build the entire like like say we did the um, we did the micro tractor build this year. Someone remotely could be prototyping that completely using a laser cutter like that. So that's I think that's very very useful. I think we can really beef up our prototyping infrastructure with an access to a very small laser cutter like that that really won't break the bank the, that laser head itself is sixty dollars on eBay so that's that's just one thing um, okay next I want to talk about the micro factory hero X so I've been thinking about it a lot I have not t taken any action on that hero X is the crowdfunded crowd design challenge and I will put on the uh, work on the cordless drill or power tool construction set so a cordless drill that's completely 3d printed so the hero x would be a big prize for developing a commercial grade uh small tool which would have also interchangeable heads so you can convert it to other things like jigsaws or you know drills band saws like a lot of, a lot of different cordless tools so it'd be basically a, a handle a tool head a motor a battery pack think about a tiny 
cordless chainsaw even those exist too so yeah um haven't taken a, any action on that outside of lots of uh thinking about it but i want to post that up raise money for an award an award and that's also another way to add a financial feedback loop here uh you guys are going to be most qualified to compete for that actually so so that competition is going to be open to everyone and um the requirements are going to be hardcore open source like for example you're going to have to use freecad for the modeling of it because otherwise no one can communicate with your cad so it has to be cad freecad compatible and using like all 100 percent open source libre tool chains for the for, for that um okay so next time here on my my line here is a cb press marketing website uh, so both for the 3D printer and for the CEB press and then for the, the house, which we'll talk about later. I mean, uh, on the house, we're, um, if you look at the PV system and the hydronic stove, if you can paste those screenshots of those, those have been finished. But marketing websites, collaborative websites where we have like, say, d3d.opensourceecology.org or like, say, cb.opensourceecology.org. Uh, and then you can clone those websites. So what we want to do is design all those templates so that you can actually start marketing stuff. Basically, I think about marketing uh, collaboratively so, so everyone's involved. And I, I know that may not make a lot of sense to you people, but as we flesh this out, I think there is a huge case for uh, collaborative market development. Just like Linux, I mean, how do you relate that to Linux? In Linux, it's kind of much easier like in Linux, you're a software programmer, you get hired by somebody, you make code for somebody. Um, I would make the case that the marketing aspect of that is not, like the financial feedback loop is much more easy. For us, for physical hardware, um, we can take a very deliberate step in helping uh, get people set up for that. So that includes both the hardware equipment, the micro factory aspect, the 3D printer, laser cutter, the other tools, that we make available readily um, and also the software back end, back ends that make that all feasible so the kind of stuff like Lex is working on um, and Lex uh, maybe I can hear more stuff about what your thoughts on the marketing side are as well but that's that's in the works too so so definitely and and the basically what we're saying here is that we're making it different from everyone else that we're also revealing the source code of the websites of all the marketing stuff just radically distributive enterprise google it distributive enterprise all right so that's what we really stand close to okay uh pv system okay uh, i was hoping somebody would paste that in um the pv system there's a video i just wanted to paste it uh, the idea here is to paste this in a, in a working doc so that when people see this they can kind of see the scope and breadth of what OSE is working on instead of looking everywhere so um because these are public documents the meeting agendas we'd like to pretty much paste like whatever whatever is happening but if you want to take a look at that that's uh basically walk through the pv system um what i'm seeing there right right there is um for example that's the pv powered fridge which uses eight watts on average you can find out how we did that super efficient uh and more about the pv system and then uh, so that video has been published. The hydronic stove is complete and working. Look at that baby. It's it's really nice uh, from the very build to heat right now using a fully open source system. So that's all good. And we actually installed a pellet stove backup, just one of those pellet stove appliances. We are going to put a pellet burner head onto the stove itself, but we did a, a pellet stove backup in the meantime, partly because it was most freezing weather we've had in a very long time here so it was actually uh when a stove burns out it it got cold like at night i mean that's the thing but anyway we're going to open source the pellet burner which is we've got a partial prototype built already but you can take a look at more of that okay so that's that's kind of all on my side i want to get into uh well thunderhead thunderhead let's take a look at that the picture of that is like that that's that's supported to freecad in the working document there so, th so as you see, it's a much more co sophisticated system. It contains also a water bath for cooling the filament because, uh, yeah, I mean, it's find out more about it. You can see the video, uh, see some of the videos online. Uh, but you can also go to Tech for Trade, uh, the, click the link there, and all that documentation is there. Matt is doing extensive documentation on the extruder right now. So 
uh, like all the you know all the designs and here's a very nice diagram of it software it's all it's all there so let's do that so in the background here we've got a few people building 3d printers Germain, Steven, Roberto and Ahmed in Saudi Arabia um, are any of you guys online and do you want to just briefly report on where we are with that because because part of the effort was like some of the next critical items on the on the 3d printing is to do a better extruder I think that's a it's perhaps the number one priority to get a better extruder that we make ourselves because one they're kind of hard to uh, some of them are a little different when you buy them off the shelf and it's a real pain to make it work in a in a workshop where sometimes uh, they're just slightly different and they don't work or you have to we have to modify parts and so forth so we want to definitely do the our own 3d printer head that's interchangeable as I mentioned with the laser little laser cutter um, but we also want to print thicker filaments so three millimeter filament with the uh, with the volcano nozzle like like 1.3 millimeter nozzles for much faster printing of much larger things like like one discussion I'm in right now is uh, another open source project on a windmill where we can 3d print the, the blades that would be really good for that we need to have a larger printer and fast printing because otherwise with the small nozzles prints take forever uh, but let's let's talk about that any reports on that Roberto can you fill us in where you're at Mm-hmm. Uh, well, I, 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 I'm not sure how to, how to say my, uh, my... Yeah, so, so the question for you would be uh, uh, regarding prototyping the actual... We can borrow the, the Prusa i3 extruder, that design, the latest design that I have, adapt that for our printer as a, as a step. Um, can you begin working on that, or like, what's are there holdups, or tell me a little more. Oh, oh yeah, I, I think I can. I recently um, I could use the heated bed, and it's working fine. So uh, now I think I can print larger. Mhm. Mm okay. Yeah. So so the next steps there. I mean, if you can if you can do that. Uh, have you looked at downloading the, the actual design from the Prusa i3 site? Yeah, I, I, I have it. Um, my question is, um, are we going to add the extruder to the current yeah. x-axis? Yep. Right? yep, we do want to do that. So, so right now, I think the the way to proceed on that, yeah, to do exactly that, adapt it, just modify it a little bit, so that we can put it onto our current uh, current printer. Um, do you have a ver? Okay, so so one thing that would be really good, can you do a com like update the existing CAD that we have to reflect exactly what you have on your your 3D printer? Because I don't think we updated the CAD of the old 8 inch version 3D printers um, and you have the third you have the 13 inch frame is that correct do you remember yeah because because I know that we made so many different versions that the actual like what we want to do is have a complete version of, of that of exactly that which you have because that's you know that's one you can call it one fork or one version of it. We need like the exact model of that. Uh, so the, the the good thing to do would be to to model that exactly and then make your modification on a print head, like how you're actually going to attach that to that. Can you think you could do that to draw up the the full CAD and the the new print head? Yeah, I think I can do that. Okay. Yeah. So let's let's get going on that and. Uh, Basically, as far as the schedule for this year, like I want to, uh, as far as the workshops that I run, I want to do the 12-inch version, but I, I do want to do the our own fi filament extruder head 
so this would be relevant for that. I am thinking probably like April or so, probably schedule the first workshop at that time because, uh, yeah, yeah, just kind of take some time to regroup, reorganize for this year. Make sure the design is perfect and probably do the, the website. Well, I mean, continue working on a website for the 3D printer and, and generate different aspects of that like like the how do you run a workshop with that 3d printer so so we have to do some finishing work like the product it's not like a hundred percent it's like a uh, few updates and and modifications that we wanted to make it better namely like the better print head and some of the refinements to optimize the print bed area and stuff like that so from your model for example roberto you should see that the exact uh, you have an 8 by 8 inch bed, but I don't think you're getting the full 8 by 8 inches. So, so to modif make modifications so, so that we can extend the, the actual working working area, like make it as perfect as possible for the versions that we have to work with. Because little improvements can be made, like increasing the, the bed size and so forth. So, um, yeah, if you could cut it up and, and basically, um, can you basically, like after you... Re, re, take a look at the filament extruder like are you in a position where you can actually start modifying it and um, you do you have everything I mean everything that you need to do that or do you have any questions um, about the um, the attachment to the the axis is yeah. going to be with magnets also or yeah I'd say that's that's an easy way to do it since we've got the magnetic head that can accept whatever kind of a head that we put on it. I think design it for that first. I mean, I think that's a good thing, like especially if we do, like say we want to do the laser head on it. Um, I think that that works well. That would work well for quick exchange. So I think I think we can do that. Um, I know that people like in practice we found that the magnets are kind of painful to work with because they're so strong and they tend to jump out. It's not so easy to attach them. But we're gonna have to make it work and, and you know do that reliably because I think the magnetic mount is pretty good for the head, including the idea that the head can break off the machine if you have an accident of some sort. So it's good for safety as well. Um, but yeah, um, I would say use the existing system that we have right now. So take the the X like the carriage part with all its magnet holes and then do an interface piece for that not the holder for the extruder but then this new extruder is going to attach directly without that holder bracket because now the, we use the holder bracket because there's no way to otherwise connect the the, st the stepper motor the extruder motor but if we design the prusa style extruder prusa i3 uh, then we can make it fit directly on our carriage so yeah modify the the prusa to make that happen I think that's straightforward. Uh, do we have Steven on a call? Steven, no Steven today? Okay, uh, let's move on. Um, do we have Germán? Germán, is that how you say it? Um, no? Okay, no, no, never mind. Okay, um, Lex, are you on? Can you fill us in on Dev Workbench and other stuff you're working on and any comments you have? Wait, was Lex not on? Looks like Lex is not on. Okay. Nope. No Lex. Okay. Abe, um, any thoughts on um, on the tract or anything? Can you hear me okay? Yep. Okay. Uh, yeah, Lex, I think earlier in the... Uh, uh, said he was going to be running late. Okay. Uh, but then, I, I guess he thought he wasn't, but in the Slack channel he'd said something. Um, yeah, I was looking over... Let's see reviewing tractor and the power cube stuff and i think i got uh, i think there's just i was going to organize some stuff on the wiki and change some things related to the power cubes um i think i got a bunch of stuff done before on the 
power cube for the new one, which I think is it's seven, it's seventeen eleven is what it was named, and that's I guess I'm in a primary and auxiliary power cube uh, designed for the large tractor. Kind of separated the versions of those. I think I still need to uh, kind of clean up some of the, the libraries on the wiki, maybe on that. Uh, make sure I get all the different stuff on that. Plus, I think mm, I'm, I'm not sure we don't have. I was going to make some other documents because uh, I think there may be. Let's see. There's different versions uh, for the 1710 power cube. There's let's see. There's a bomb, and then there's like the micro track spreadsheet, and I think there's differences. Uh, between those, and I'm not sure. I think some of that was just related to the spreadsheet and what, uh, how many units were being made. But I wanted to, I guess, need to verify what sort of parts uh, I think are going into the the different mm -hmm. power cubes. Mm -hmm. um, I think the, if the pumps and everything are going to be similar and that kind of stuff. Uh, I guess we have we don't really have a bomb for that yet, unless it's pretty similar I assume to the old ones but yeah okay uh, so let's see which which of those um, tasks we want to take a look at. do you want to take a look at um, your log to, to see a little bit more about this or do you want to sh share your screen or anything um, let's see what do I have? Uh... let's go over that a little bit um, as far as the micro track status so I've I've done a bit of digging with it quite a bit around the house. It's pretty awesome. Um, improvements there. There was a little bit of issue on curl for some reason. Like the, some, sometimes the curl of the cylinder was getting messed up and I actually don't know the reason for that. That's uh, when I throttled it up quite a bit it it would like not move the curl properly and I don't know what it is. It's not the valve and I got to troubleshoot that a little bit. Uh, and of course it's been freezing cold out here so that's the tractor's just sitting out there. Um, definitely uh, wanna once it gets a little warmer just start using it again and and document it and make it make it work and organize um, another workshop on it we don't have one coming up for next year yet um, okay Abe let's see are you trying to share yeah. share your screen um, share I guess what I have on the had for the power cube and let's see as far as the um, I guess the, the life track the larger tractor um, what, what kind of timeline uh, we're thinking about that I think you mentioned before but yeah it'd be good to kind of prioritize things in the, in the new year and right. also I think uh, we're going to have to at some point make a priority I guess after the tractor is more formally established the CNC torch table is like right. important yeah. For that build. So it is. That's still got it worked out, right? Yeah, so so I haven't touched it. Like right now I'm playing with the 3D printers a little bit to, just to send one out. But next week uh, I'm looking at getting back to the torch table. That is absolutely right. Before we build anything, like I, I want to make sure that... So, so basically like February, March, April, I'll just be shaking down the torch table. It's, it's such a critical machine for the whole system that I just want to get that perfected and then when we design for the next build we can use our own that's the idea so so it's true it might be quite useful depending on where we are here to do some work on a torch table like for one we don't really have like yeah I mean there's plenty of work on a torch table uh, from CAD to everything else because like when we go to the power cubes and everything else we'll We'll cut them out fully with the CNC torch table and then make a better way for like as I was talking about the enterprise aspect if if we have access to a low cost torch table that's that's a huge case to start pushing that out to the world as in okay here's our plants here's our torch table get involved you can actually start producing making a living out of that as a, as a viable enterprise so the torch table is a major items um, as a priority yeah Abe so we're looking at your screen here yeah so I think that this is the uh, smaller power cube 1711 I think I've counted the auxiliary 
I've got like almost 22 by uh-huh. 20 inches for that one. It's got the, uh, what is it, the, the 12, uh, the smaller cooler, 1240. And let's see what's the other dimension here. Uh, okay. Oh, that's a, that's cool. Okay, that's really nice. So, for anyone who wants to open up that file, um, yeah. Abe, is that the file you're talking about? I pasted in the. Uh, that's the PC seventeen eleven auxiliary, meaning one of the smaller power cubes that are without yeah. the hydraulic reservoir. As w when we're scaling, one power cube has the hydraulic reservoir. The remaining ones don't need one. That's a great way to scale to to, lar to higher power. Um, let's see where did my download go? Okay. Yeah. No, that's that's looking pretty good. What what's what remaining work has to be done? So I'm seeing the. The cooler. I mean, I think there's plumbing. Plumbing needs to be needs to happen. Yeah, I mean, that, all those, all that detail, all that kind of detail, yeah, would have to be filled in. I mean, imported the pump, I think, from one of the previous ones there, uh, with that that design, which I assume may be uh, the same. It made it so that that fits. Um, but I think I think that's a pump that will design work on there. A lot of, I know a lot of times the pumps have been, some of the CAD for those wasn't exact. Yeah. Because sometimes the dimension of the website, I think on yeah. Surplus Center, it wasn't quite enough detail. Uh, I've had trouble sometimes finding specs on some of those okay. uh, yeah. items. Okay. Yeah. Can I ask you for this? Uh, let's, in, as we go into the new year, kind of as we, we beef up our wiki infrastructure, um, can you put in a development template, the, the abridged one, so so what I'll show, let's see if people want to take a look at, um, there's a page on the wiki called development template, and in it there's a shorter one, and there's, um, uh, where is it, usage, Wait, what happened to, there's a, where did that go? Development template. Okay, something vanished here, but there's a, there's a development template that's got like 40 lines. I made another one that has about 20 lines in it. It's the abridged development. Uh, by development, you mean a spreadsheet? Or yeah. Yeah, spreadsheet. Okay. What happened to that? Let me just look at that page. Uh, because, um, yeah, definitely what we want to do, like the general practice is whatever machine that we do as a new build, it really needs its own development template because there's just too many things like uh, to track and it's, that's an easy way. It only takes a couple of minutes to put that. So so make it, make it a habit to put in a full development template so we at least have great placeholders for that. Um, view history here, let me just take a look at that real quick. I am so confused here because I just downloaded the shorter template. Um, template. Oh wow. Okay, go to this page. We got to fix that. There's uh two pages with a development template. So the correct page with a development template is this one. So if you look on the go on the wiki, the page is just called template and it has a simple template which has got 20 lines in it uh as opposed to the full template which has got about 40. So it's it's basically the abridged version, but it contains all the key elements the the full one is a little too overwhelming and this one is smaller more manageable but Abe if you wouldn't mind please uh, 
make a clone of that and embed it and make it make it editable to the world uh, so okay. that we can track all the things like for example uh, 3d CAD should have the library parts in it so if we click on a 3d CAD like for example if you had trouble okay you don't know what the pump is well we should have the, the library where the BOM for the pump and the CAD they're both con consistent and we have that all in one place so we're not switching between different versions and we don't know what which, which is which that's why I really recommend the the template as a place to organize all the assets for for one machine so if you wouldn't mind doing that and if you wouldn't mind please also set up you know just to start filling out as much of this as we can and as we go forward when we get new people on a team we can pretty much do the burn down Lex has already created a burn down graph for the devel development template so we can actually see that tracking over time one thing with a 40 item template we just never really like filled one to a hundred percent we you know we, we got you know like halfway there was just so much work right but I think with the smaller one the 20 item one we could do that as well as keep the the burn down graph so so we can see where each project is for our metrics just like we're keeping tabs of all the hour, hours of the development team uh, we want to do a burn down for every single project that we're doing and sometimes a burn down could be like when we quit that thing I mean we just call that a hundred percent burn down because it's an outdated version so that could be another way to burn down to zero if we said okay we're not doing this anymore because it's we, we, we actually moved on to a new version because something changed or, or something like that but yeah do do that and then we'll start filling in all the different elements I'd like to see if for every every machine we try to be more diligent on a template itself I know we put up a lot of we have a bunch of templates on when I started the D3D I call it 1612 so 16 inch frame and 12 inch bed so D3D 1612 if you look at that on the wiki um, I put that so if you go to uh, D3D 1612 I put the template on there because because literally every new build is a is considered a fork so yeah so I got D3D 1612 where I only got like a couple of items there like software data collection but in general the requirements are very important the calculations are very important uh, if you have those then you can you can compare very well like for example for the filament extruder like why why is the case for the larger thunderhead filament maker well the calculations are going to show you or the data is going to show you that wow its throughput is so much greater than the uh, Lyman filament maker and that makes it very feasible for for actual small-scale microfactory work and stuff like that but anyway um, use the development templates um, what else on a power cube Abe so so you know we touched on the parts we want to make sure we've got all the parts correct because um, the better we make the documentation the more people more we can invite people to to collaborate like for example we can say hey uh, you know a new person arrives on a team we can tell them hey fix the pump because it's not correct and they'll they'll be able to trace okay this is our bill of materials these are our other information and all that they can make calculations that would say hey we don't want to use this pump we want to use another pump because it's it's got more flow or something so yeah uh, the more we documented the better um, Abe can you summarize the next steps on this on the power cube there as far as the cat itself goes okay yeah I just made a copy of that spreadsheet so that's okay I, I paste on my log, I'll, I'll get to excellent, excellent. one later. Um, get that updated. Let's see. The mounting, you know, the mounting cube. system, like, for example, details yeah. of the mounting of the of the I cooler. Everything up. I, I, I got a lot of details in there. Like, I think there was some concern before about the motor, the spacing, because of, like, the rubber feet on the motor. So I think I tried to get that spacing right based on what I've I understood okay. from that. I positioned everything in that CAD. Uh, hopefully, I do. Although I think it's hard to tell sometimes on the positioning exactly of uh, how we're going to mount the yeah. uh, cooler and that kind of stuff. It, it yeah, let me in be, interrupt uh, for uh, a major point here. The cooler right now is not in front of the fan. The fan is the actual blue circular part. That's where the air is blown. So you got it in a place where there is no air motion. You see what I mean? 
we we wanted to put the cooler in front of the the air intake of the engine which has a lot of blow of air so that we're cooling it automatically so you'd have to move it to the next side over on the front no no so what the air intake is is when you pull the pull cord on the on the engine there's a fan mounted right to the rotor of the engine and that's on the front of the motor so that's where we need it it's right in there's some type of motor fan okay I was thinking it's connected directly to the engine shaft so it's in line with the engine shaft it's just the the extension of the engine shaft which is at okay. the front yeah okay i was thinking the air intake with the filter and yeah no was, no i was confused about that until somebody explained what they meant about the air intake as well. No, it's not in front of the filter. It's the actual fan on the motor itself, which is got oh, a lot okay. of flow. Yeah. Let's move it to the other side then. Yep. Yeah. So do that. That's that's a major one. Uh, the kind of detail that we want to get up to in this kind of CAD that makes it really valuable is when you actually take the expanded metal metal mesh, draw the actual rubber mounts and exactly how they're gonna fit. So it's completely technically correct so that we know that we're not going to get into issues like I know we got into little issues about the cooler ending up not fitting in the last build because there was just not enough detail as far as the exact exact mounting or maybe the engine was a little bit off but I'll try to take a look at more of the dimensions verify that what we have here as our current engine model is pretty correct because that's going to be important going forward as that's the engine that we're, we're using yeah okay so see if you can you can refine that make some refinements there um yeah, yeah. we can get a lot more accurate on the cad uh, at least i'm having more luck with free cad no, uh, i've been using leaving in a lot more of the constraints and using those kind of figuring out based off of what alberto and stuff before um usually i've had not a lot of luck with having the constraints in there but lately mm -hmm. i don't know it's the way i've been able to learn to do it it's it enables a lot more detail and adjustment but it requires a lot more work on the metadata and labeling everything and tracking uh all the parts in their positions yep but we should be able to detail uh positions and parts uh down to, so there's no more complete problems it, as long as we get enough information to start with which i think sometimes that is the off-the-shelf parts so I don't know it's sometimes you need specifications or measurements off those parts uh, when they're after they're ordered I think to help with that double check stuff but I know sometimes that's bumped right up against the workshop like there's a lot of time so yeah planning that better well, right yeah um, no I mean I think yeah, we got to do better on a lot of things. One thing is that if we can master the CAD that it's actually super accurate, then that will also open up um, more flexibility on our part. I mean, the goal is to keep streamlining this to make it more uh, more manageable, more efficient to to run an event. Like, I mean, that's the goal. I mean, still, you know, we're we're struggling for every event to get everything just in time. And of course, it's extreme manufacturing concept that you're doing it in such such a short time but i think we're getting there especially if we have the torch table where we're actually cutting our parts we can do that uh, we have much more flexibility on the order for the metal and stuff like that so that's good um yeah yeah and once there's fewer parts that keep changing uh like once the prototypes get a little more established I mean, they, they are prototypes, obviously. Yeah. You can develop a more static supply chain on right. certain parts, then it'll be less less of a problem. Right, right. Just Yeah, supply chain is that's you know, a big, hard part of any hardware work. But yes, as we get better, we can refine that. And the more things we can make in house the easier the supply chain is like when we start cutting out the all the metal parts that's going to be easier and so forth um do you want to let's see do you have any other other work that you have uh, on cad or let's see i think okay. i may have uh different uh power cubes let's see 
clarify probably both of these. I think the larger power cube is uh, this one here. So, yeah, this is the one with the tank. Not a lot different, just I guess I've got the uh, cooler on the oxide again. So I assume that was there. It takes, so I'll move, move that around if they want to adjust. But the tank and everything, I tried to detail. I think I talked to you before about I was trying to figure out the order of operations of welding and the tank, but it sounds like it's easier to do it all together. And yeah, I think I, yeah, definitely. I had to so that it was put on be positioned in some way that I thought was relatively easy to uh, weld up. I, I know you said the welding that was kind of hard. I wonder what kind of if you mentioned if you were using um, holders, maybe like magnets and things to hold the, the corners together to make it easier to weld. I thought I read something like that. Um, usually you need some type of way to clamp that yeah, yeah, angles, yeah, angle magnets, yep, we can do that. Yeah, probably pretty print some type of handy holder. Yeah, I mean, just angles with magnets on them work yeah. well, that's one way. Or you can just re use regular welding magnets, like off-the-shelf yeah. ones. So, okay, yeah. so uh, I see that there is no PowerCube version 1711, which, um, please start that. So... Uh, in the document, both the, oh no. both the CAD files are labeled. Let's see, did I upload? No, that's good. That's good. But the wiki page called PowerCube version version seven eleven, seven eleven. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so I, I typed that in. Let's see. Unless we talked about them before, I thought I made one. Um, you did. Let me. It may be in my old log. I'll double check. Um, yeah no i'm not seeing the power cube version 711 so yeah check on that and let's open up a new page put your uh cad file link them there and put the development template in there so we we know that's the official placeholder and 17 point sorry 17.11 did i say 10 um 11 refers to november which is when we started working on this so that's good that's um nomenclature yeah. by the time we start working on the project yep um okay. or when it's built or yeah. when, when we start working on it yep yeah i don't see where i made a page i think i added it to the um to the power cube library i think that's what I. Did. yeah yeah no i know you've got the uh, file on the wiki yeah. let's let's start a new page to make it very modular so we're not confusing this we can always refer to the power cube version 1710 um, but all the assets relevant for 1711 should be ported over whether you're just copying and pasting or something else but yeah let's keep it separate so we're not confusing version that's one of the main things to keep track of in a, in a project all right okay let's move on here so I want to hear from let's see I see Michelle you're on as well here um, any report from yourself Okay. Uh, for the add on and uh, yeah, the, whole, the whole process. From, uh, from free guests to uh, Blender to uh, OneGL. Looking into solving the, the problems uh, that were still uh, 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 unsolved, like uh, naming and uh, uh -huh. uh, making a multi file add on. Okay. So I'm going to just uh, focus on that. Uh, that's taken long enough. Okay. Yeah, no, that's good. That's that's going to be very important like for the website, everything else. Um, and uh, the report on uh, as far as the build event for Saudi Arabia that is still not on a calendar so fortunately we don't have that yet um, so not yet 
Um, as far as, um, so, so you guys might have noticed, I also went to Costa Rica. We are planning to currently, like we got to organize all of that, but for, for May, there's a tentative date for a CEB press build in Costa Rica, which would actually be a first international build, but the situation there looks good. There's an individual there who, who kind of, um, he's developing a, developing land developing a community down there he, he's uh, been established down there but he wants to build a brick press to build some structures with and and we can do that and the, qu the question there would be to, to make sure we can get our hands on like six mig welders to make that happen in costa rica but otherwise it's like with a digital design as long as we can get the cnc cutouts down there or possibly have to ship that uh, we'd have to work that out somehow. So there's a number of details that are not worked out yet. But if it's if we can resolve all the issues, we'd like to do a build down in Costa Rica, which is where I got my first chance to do some kite surfing. People, I recommend it. It's awesome stuff. <laughs> uh, and if we establish so so you know that's an initial contact with Costa Rica. But I also visited Belize and Scott Mater, who's one of our longtime supporters. He's bought a couple of our brick presses. Uh, he's interested in setting up OSC South down there, and that's that's positive. So, so as we kind of go forward next year or two, if we build up our operations here, that we maybe have some of the regular ongoing workshops, uh, we definitely want to consider... Uh, Belize as a potential site. I mean, he's got land down there, like 60 acres, which is right now blank, and we could develop that into a training facility or something like that and, and start producing equipment down there. It was very interesting. I, they have a Mennonite community down there where they make their own equipment. Like, for example, they have this crazy-looking agricultural sprayer with huge metal wheels. I mean, it looks like Mad Max. Um kind of like our stuff exactly but yeah they 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 have access to metal down there so surprisingly in Belize which is not so industrial I mean they do have access to metal the the Mennonites down there do build their metal stuff so we actually checked on getting metal like half inch steel down there and it's quite accessible at the same price like in like in America pretty much but it was pretty amazing uh, it's kind of refreshing to see a bunch of the kind of the third world style stuff and in Belize but then there's the like the the Mennonites they're very productive they run a lot of their agriculture build their own equipment it was kind of like feels like somewhat like Missouri where there's Amish people and they have their communities where they kind of run their complete economies somewhat independent of the the world around them it was interesting to see but the bottom line of that is that we can get steel down there if we wanted to so so that's interesting um, yeah yeah so so that's kind of we don't have a schedule for the whole year i am still trying to put one together by february 1st as far as what workshops we want to run this year uh, i do want to run a bunch of 3d printers there's two people that want to get brick presses this year so planning on at least two brick press workshops and i want to get them so streamlined that they're they're very efficient and and we can start teaching people how to do them um, currently, Katarina is working on a documentation for the CD Eco Home. She got back to full time of the documentation part. We're looking at as soon as all that documentation is done, we're looking at setting up a training program for for builders. So the prerequisite is getting the full documentation on all the systems, including how to how to organize a build of a house. So there's a lot of work, documentation, and training, and all this kind of material. So. Lots of, lots of available work all over the place. And we definitely want to have people start replicating this as a source of livelihood. So uh, that's that. Uh, let's see now. So if we go back to the agenda for today, I think that kind of wraps it up for what we have. Uh, we'll continue working. So so basically, Roberto, the definite specific task on starting to look into the, the extruder upgrade, uh, getting to work on that. If uh, since the extruder is a small sub sub module, but it's also very important, and we're starting that process from scratch. Uh, also, if you wouldn't mind, please create the development template from that using template, um, the short 20 item template from the template page on the wiki. 
um, and I'll just uh, paste that uh, next to you there template I pasted it on the first page please use that um, to set up a template because that's going to be a nice development process where we pretty much uh, after we have that done I mean we're first of all we're modifying it we want to make sure that um, the sensor is working well as we go to larger just one more comment as we go to larger build surfaces like right now we're at the 12 inch but I want to I mean I just want to start enlarging that and just keep going bigger and bigger uh, so we can print larger things like the say the 3d printer printed wind turbine blades and things uh, but we're gonna have to master the kind of like the the flatness of the bed surface including like we might have to go to a larger uh, sensor I don't know uh, hopefully that works but I know that the sensor right now is very very close to the PEI surface sometimes it hits so there, it's a little tricky to get that we might have to make use a larger one which has a slightly larger space to the print surface or something like that but yeah it's gonna be just a little bit of development work making sure that larger extruders are working um, and right now we're just going like for the Prusa they're they're just working with a 1.75 millimeter thread so that's that's still very small but we'll get to larger ones later um, so yeah continue on that um, I'm continuing on the on the book work and also want to start putting up the Microfactory Hero X pretty soon working on a torch table uh, as a high priority so we can start cranking out metal parts ourselves and so forth Okay, so that's I think that's about it. Any any other questions or comments here? Otherwise, we can wrap up and uh, call it a day. Uh, okay, no, hold on a second, Ruslan. Um, so Ruslan is a is a new developer here, and we forgot to pump you in there. Where where are you? Uh, you're not on an agenda. <laughs> um, but Ruslan has been working on a pipe pipe fittings macro for FreeCAD. Ruslan, can you pipe in a little bit? No pun intended. <laughs> yeah, your latest. Just fill in, fill in everybody what you have done, so people first of all are aware of what you've been doing, because we haven't talked about your work. Oh, okay. You, uh, last time we were talking, you gave me a task to to start my contribution with a little pipe and fighting. Uh, pipe. Fighting. Parts. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and uh, I started to make to make uh, this pass and then realized that uh, you know, it's maybe easier to uh, to do stuff automatically. Yeah. And just uh, parameterize the and in the end I made um, a couple of macros. I uh, experiment uh, was experimenting with uh, elbow. Uh, but when you can give uh, dimensions, um, uh, an angle, uh, pipe size, and then uh, this macro will create uh, some one of the possible elbows. There, there are multiple. Yep. Uh, and uh, now I think it. Uh, I can use this file as a temp uh, template to create other macros like keys and uh, mm -hmm. conflicts. Um, when yeah. And the uh, idea is uh, to separate the data. One of the ideas is to separate uh, data, which is now which now can be stored in uh, CSP files and macro, and the macro itself, and uh, everyone can uh, then adjust uh, data according to some uh, um, producers of these uh, elements. Nice. Uh, manufacture, not by, by that. Yeah. So. Yeah, basically the idea is that we're going to be able to generate pipe, elbows, fittings, tees, um, pipes. 
which is very important actually so if we want to like when we're going to get to the cd eco home later this year for documentation uh the plumbing there the biodigester system that's all pipes and elbows and t's uh so so we're going to basically model have a quicker ability to model things that have pipes so we're making essentially like a pipe almost a pipe workbench right now it's in the form of a macro um but possibly we can have turn that into a workbench so we, when we when we want to have any kind of a pipe fitting of, of which there are many many sizes we get that automatically without any sweat just like there's a bolt macro a bolt workbench fasteners workbench and FreeCAD. this is going to be one for pipes which is going to be very useful for us to allow us to prototype much faster uh, uh ruslan i'd like to ask you do you think you can do a product demo for us next next meeting we can do a little screenshot and you can show us how you generate the pipe sections a little walkthrough on that Where you would you be able to share your screen and, and demonstrate how you're generating so that we all learn? Uh, okay, okay. I, I hope to do. Okay. To be able to do it. Yeah. Let's see how far you get. So possibly we have a, a demo pipe pipe fittings demo from Ruslan next uh, next week. And we want to wrap that up because I know you've been on it. We we wanted to do that as small task. Of course, like everything, it turn small tasks turn into larger tasks. So um, yeah, please wrap it up. Uh, so we can maybe move you on to some other more interesting tasks unless unless you're you're really interested in continuing on this kind of thread uh, but yeah there's there's other things we can we can do like for example applying these to to the actual design of a thing like the biodigester and things like that so we actually model modeling real real useful things with this so yep yes this is a good idea to apply uh, to apply yep. uh, these macros also to test yeah 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 we can readily apply that to you know I, I'm actually gonna be working on a biodigester here um, this week so I can actually that's actually a fitting time to do that no pun intended again <laughs> all right uh, okay, okay, I got it. <laughs> um, yeah so so continue on that please and uh, hopefully we'll see uh, little demo next next week so we can actually apply that to the digester because uh, we do want to get full CAD for all the subsystems of the CD Eco home which then would enable a person like Michelle to also put that into into the WebGL so we have fully fully documented systems like that okay that sounds great well thank you everybody so yeah let's continue then next week we'll continue uh, making the road by walking here uh, 2 p.m. again uh, hope to see everyone there and we'll continue with our mission here so thank you thank you everybody and see you next week see you. bye bye